Open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, Psalm chapter 1. And we are going to begin with uh, verse 5 this morning. This morning, we're going to talk about a better life. And uh, there's only one message left in this series after this. And uh, I I really hope that this has been a a blessing to you, uh, going verse by verse through uh, Psalm 1. I know a lot of us uh, know Psalm 1 by heart. It's uh, next to Psalm 23. It's probably the most, uh, uh, the, the most uh, notable, most memorized, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, most quoted. And uh, so, so this is a, a, a real a blessing to me because I get to actually spend time and, and labor through this. But uh, here we are this morning, and by way of introduction, let me just say something about the electronic chips in your card. How many of you have got a card, and they've got these, these electronic chips? Anybody? I think we all have to have them now, and uh, oftentimes when I go to the, uh, usually I go to Menards, I've been spending a lot of time there with our building project, but they, uh, they insert the chip, and it's denied. And you have to actually do that three times before you can traditionally swipe it. You all know that, right? It's ridiculous. This chip is horrible. I have had so many problems with my chip, with Dana's chip on her card, uh, we're, we'd like to get rid of all the chips, get the chip off the shoulder and everything. But, but, uh, but here it is, we've got these faulty cards, and there's nothing like being denied. And it's really embarrassing, I'll be honest with you. As you're standing there, you begin to sweat because, you know, you've got this backup of people behind you, and you're wondering, are they going to look at me and say, who is this guy, what, doesn't he have any money, or did he steal the card, or what, you know. And, and so my chip gets uh, denied, it gets declined, and... There are very few things that are embarrassing as not getting a, uh, as getting a reward. And, and getting denied is, is a horrible thing, and at times we feel the pressure of this. Well, this morning we're going to talk about a denied man. A denied man, verse 5. And uh, denial can lead to a bunch of problems. It can have its benefits, though. Uh, I don't want to say all denial is bad. Uh, denying yourself certain things is a good thing. Uh, I, have, uh, I tell people I don't have a sweet tooth, I have sweet teeth, and uh, I have many of them. I can't seem to get rid of them. Uh, eventually, when I'm probably Maxine's age, I'll get rid of all my teeth. <laughs> she just stares at me. She's like, you're mine afterwards. Anyway. Uh, but it can cause all sorts of problems if you don't deny yourself certain things. Uh, such as weight gain, diabetes, all these things. So sometimes denying ourselves things is a good thing. It's called self-control. And uh, I don't know about you, but I struggle with self-control. At times, I struggle with self-motivation, kind of being a self-starter, just getting up and getting the job done. And, and uh, we will talk about that in a little bit later. But, but uh, not all denial is bad. Not all denial is good. And I think for the most part, we all, we all want acceptance. We all want to be acceptance. We all want that acceptance, be accepted by people. But acceptance, at the, at, 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 for the sake of acceptance and, uh, and, uh, and compromising in order to be accepted is not a good thing. So some acceptance is good. We will be accepted in the beloved, and we'll talk about that later. So some acceptance is good, and some acceptance is bad. Being accepted by a gang, for instance, is, is not a good thing. But being accepted by Christ is, an, is a very good thing. We don't want to compromise. Some denial is good, some denial is bad. Some acceptance is good, some is bad. But this morning, let's look at point one, a de- denied rewards. Denied rewards, point one. Begins in Psalm 1.5 where it says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This judgment is referring to the judgment when we stand before the Lord and give an account for the works which we've done. That's what this judgment is referring to. And at the judgment seat of Christ, when our works are tried by fire, only the good workers receive a good reward. The ungodly are denied rewards because their work was wicked. And we see this illustration building from the previous verse, verse 4. 
So we see it, we see it growing where, where, the, where the, the ungodly are not so, they're not prosperous, they're not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. So that's where this illustration is going. And all the chaff is gathered, the stuff that isn't blown away, the rest of it is gathered, and it's burned by fire because it's useless. It's, 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 of, it's of no value. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. This is the judgment which we're, it's referring to. The judgment where we stand before the Lord and say, Lord, are my works acceptable? Not to get into heaven, but because we are going to heaven. Remember, our, the, the salvation is not a work which we do. It's accepting, it's putting our faith in the work which God has done for us on our behalf. But there is a reality to the things that we do here on earth. What will be the reward for that? And we see here, we are denied rewards. Now, let me say two things real quickly about this judgment. Two things about this judgment. First of all, first of all, we must all appear. No one is exempt from appearing before Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. This, this verse right here should, uh, by some means, compel us, motivate us to live a life that honors God. Should at least, by some means, get us moving down the road of, of trying to serve the Lord with our work. Not trying to earn our salvation by our work, but trying to serve the Lord with our work. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I know that when I was a kid, we had, uh, we had tests we had to take in school. I was a horrible test taker. I was a horrible test taker. How many of you were good at taking tests? Anybody? Okay, good. So a lot of you. How many were horrible at taking tests? I am so bad at taking tests. I just, I just don't get it. But I do know this, that the teacher demanded that I was there in order to get a grade. I had to at least show up. Now there was some work that I would needed to do that I needed to do on the back end which would help me get a better grade, right? And the more work that you do, the better your grade is in the end. And there are Christians, there are Christians that think that they will not have to appear before the judgment seat. There are Christians that are not doing what they could do for the Lord. And what a shame that is. Because we all must appear before the judgment seat. We must all appear. Now let me say this as well. That there are some Christians that think, well maybe, maybe the work that I do is, is, is insufficient anyway, or maybe there are some that say, well I don't really have to appear. That maybe God will give me a, a passing grade and give me rewards even though I don't appear before the judgment seat. But did you know that that's not true? We must all be there to receive our rewards. Both the godly and the ungodly are going to have this judgment seat. Now can I say this as well? Whether there's a person who's an atheist or an agnostic, the godly, the ungodly, there's no difference. There are some people who say, well maybe I can be exempt from that. And there's a great passage in Proverbs 22.2. It says that the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Did you know that whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're good, whether you're bad, whether you're saved or not, you're going to have to appear before some judgment seat. Now the judgment seat that this is referring to is the Bema seat where we will get rewards, but nonetheless we will have to appear before the judgment seat. Number one, we must all appear. Number two... Number two, we must all give an account. We must all give account. No one is exempt from giving an account for what they have done. In Romans 14, 11 through 12, it says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Not only must we appear, we must give an account 
while appearing before God, we have to give an account for all of our actions and our inactions. Now let me explain that. Our actions are things that we've done. Our actions are, are, are maybe opportunities that we've seized. We have to give an account for that. What have you done with what you have? What have you done with what you have? But on the flip side of that, we have to give an account for the things that we have not done. That's the things that we aren't doing that we could be doing. That's the things where there may have been an opportunity had we seized it, but yet we have rejected the opportunity. In Matthew 12, 36, it says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. We don't have to just give an account for the things we've said that are worthy of something, but also the things that are idle, that are vain, that are worthless, that are empty, that are, in a sense, chaff. Just like we see in verse 4 of Psalm 1. Everyone is going to have to appear, and everyone's going to have to give an account. Now let me just say this by way of application to point one, and that is that there is no adequate apology. There is no adequate apology. And there is no neutrality with God. In Matthew 12, 30, it says, And he, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. If you're not with God, you're against him. You can't say, you cannot say, well, Lord, I, I played a neutral position in this. I played a neutral position. I, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to offend. And you know what God says? Here's what he says. He says, and he that is not with me is against me. If you're not playing for the team of God, you're playing against the team of God. Does that make sense? There is no adequate apology there's not going to be anybody at the judgment seat that gets a passing grade by saying, oh Lord, forgive me for all of the things that I did in the past and, uh, and, and I should have done more work and, and, and I, should have, I should have been more faithful serving you and been more faithfully obedient. He's, he's not going to say, well, that's fine. I'm going to give you rewards anyway. Remember, this is about rewards. This isn't about salvation. Salvation is justified when you say, Lord, I believe that you died for me. It's when you accept Christ as your personal Savior. But the rewards that we have are earned by our works. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. We must all appear at the judgment. We must all give an account. But we are not all going to be able to stand in the judgment. That's what verse 5 says. One commentator had said this. He said that they will have no adequate defense. They won't have a leg to stand on. What are you going to say? What are you going to do when you have to stand before the Lord and say, we know, Lord, I realize I'm here by simple grace through faith alone. And you spared my life, maybe not once, maybe numerous times. God, I, I know that I'm here because of faith in you. But my life that I had, I did not live to the fullest. What are you going to say when you have to stand before the Lord? Are you going to get rewards? The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. You don't want to be one of those. We are denied rewards. But point two, we are denied responsibilities. We are denied responsibilities. In Psalm 1.5 it says, Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous... Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Did you know at the end of time, at the time of the judgment, the saints are to judge the world? What a responsibility. What a neat responsibility. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? We're going to be able to judge the world. But it says here that sinners won't be able to stand in the congregation of the righteous. That is that we will not be able to participate in some of the things that the godly participate in. At the time of the judgment, because the ungodly person has rejected their personal responsibility before the Lord in the past, the Lord will reject the ungodly person's responsibility later. 
That is to say that because you do not do what you should do now, you won't be able to do what you could do later. How many of us know that? That we have a responsibility now to serve the Lord the best we can. Our present behavior will affect our future blessing. And the ungodly will be denied blessing of judging the world. Now let me say this too, that the sinner, the sinner denies their responsibility before God. That is to say that we say to ourselves, you know, we don't really have a responsibility. We don't have any responsibility here on earth. We're just uh, uh, kind of live and let go, right? Kind of live and let God, kind of live and let go. We just, we just kind of live in our lives. And, and we, as a matter of fact, in Sunday school, it talked a little bit about that, that, we, that, that there is a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And many of the people that come to the Lord will be denied by the Lord because their work was wicked. Their work was wicked. In Matthew 7, 21-23, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Not only will our works not get us to heaven, but our works will not earn us rewards if we do not have works. We must have works in order to earn rewards. Let me say this quickly by application of that. First of all, we often ask ourselves why we don't get blessings like other people do. I don't know if you do that or not. I know that I do as, as a pastor. Um, we tend to measure our worth by another man's wealth. We tend to say to ourselves, well, why don't I have what others have? And, 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 I, and I do that. As, as a pastor, I, I do that, and I shouldn't do that. I say, well, why, why don't we have this, or why don't we have that? And, and, and you know, why isn't our church growing? Why is our parking lot so small? <laughs> and God knoweth. But anyway, you know, we, we tend to rate ourselves against other ministries, and we tend to rate our blessings against what other people have, what other blessings other people have, and, and we ought not to do that. And in 2 Corinthians 10.12, we see this problem, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we tend to compare ourselves with other people. We tend to compare our blessing, our reward, with other people's reward. But people are using other people as, to, as the tool by which they measure success and not the right measurement. An accurate measurement can only be taken against the divine standard. The question is, not is my blessing greater than another person's blessing, or are my rewards now, or are, will my rewards in the future be greater? But the question is, is, are you in God's will? And if you are, in fact, in God's will, then I promise you that you have a, the greatest blessing that you're going to get. If you are doing the work for the Lord that you ought to be doing, if you are trusting in Him, leaning on Him, if you are doing everything that you can do to serve the Lord now, and if you are in God's will, then the blessing that you have can never be any greater. But even though I say that, we can still compare ourselves among ourselves, don't we? We still say, well, why do they have such a, a ministry? Well, why do they have this and that? And we have to be very, very careful of it. So the first thing is, is we often ask ourselves why we are not blessed like others and we ought not to. And the second thing that we do, the second thing that we do, uh, or should be doing, is adapting to some of the qualities of those that have a better life. And you'll notice there are some distinct qualities of people who have a better life. Uh, verse 1, it says that they begin, they begin by taking right counsel, they have a right attitude, they have right actions. In verse 2, they delight in the law of God, and then they meditate day and night in the law which they delight. Uh, so so there's, these, there's these certain distinct qualities. And then in verse 4 to 5, a blessed man embraces his responsibility. 
A blessed man embraces his responsibility. He, do, he does the things that he knows he needs to do. And, and how many times have we seen this in this world where it's just in decay and we see people not, not doing what they need to be doing? There are certain responsibilities that a blessed person uh, acquires, that a blessed person does, and, and uh, the more that we mimic those, the more that we, that we go to those things, we will say, hey, th- th- there are qualities there that I need to be doing. I need to be getting right, a- uh, right counsel and having, having right actions and attitudes, and I need to be delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating day and night. And the more that you do that, the more you'll have a blessed life. But the more you decline or deny your responsibility, the more you'll be denied responsibility. The reason that we are denied responsibilities later is because we denied our responsibilities now. And can I say this too? Like never before have we had people who, who, just, who, don't, who don't do what they should be doing. And uh, we see it, in, uh, we see it in, in financially, we see it in, in families, we see uh, young, young moms and dads and, and not, not doing what they should be doing. We see, we see it in the church. We see all sorts of, 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 of a lack of responsibility. And what we need to be doing is saying, hey, this is what I need to be doing. This is responsible. The responsible person should be doing this. I remember I was, I was at a political thing on Friday. Was it Friday? And we were sitting around this uh, round table. We had, what, 20 people. There were five senators, and there were probably yes, 15, 15 people. And, uh, and we were talking to these, uh, to these senators, and they, 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 it was a discussion about gambling, marijuana, abortion, all of these things. So I felt like I could, I could uh, speak, uh, speak my mind. And, and uh, they went around. I didn't say a whole lot. But in conclusion, at the very end, I, I asked one of the senators, I said, hey, can I just, can I just throw this out there for you? Here, we're, we're talking about marijuana, abortion, gambling, taxes, and all of these things. And I said, can I just say this? Uh, and I just want to encourage you senators to understand something. That maybe, just maybe, we are treating a symptom rather than the problem. I said, this is just a symptom of a much greater problem. All of this could be solved. And I, gave the, I told him, I gave him an illustration. I said, when I went in for back pain a while back, the doctor said, well, we can give you a bunch of narcotics. And I said, I, said, I don't want something to mask the pain. I want to fix the pain. I said, I want to get, I want, I want to get in there. I want to, I want to fix my, my, there's something wrong with my spinal cord or something going on in my back. I said, that's what I want to fix. I don't, want to, I don't want to just have narcotics. And we have a responsibility, and I, and I began to think about this. If, if everybody were responsible Christians, if everybody were doing the things that they ought to be doing as Christians, we wouldn't have all of these symptoms. The problem would be, well, the problem would be solved. We don't have to get into a lot of the social type things and 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 uh, and and we do but but we don't have to if you get enough people saved that'll take care of itself you get people saved and you get them serving the lord and you get them working like the way they ought to be working not for salvation but because of salvation if you get people working for jesus you're going to solve all these problems all, all of the symptoms you're not going to have to talk about marijuana you're not going to have to talk about abortion Y'all can have to talk about gambling and taxes and, and just a, a, a variety of other things. The whole goal is let's get people saved and let's get them serving the Lord. And you know what? I tell you this, that a great reward that we'll be able to have here on earth is that we'll, we, won't, we, won't have to, we won't have to deal with all these social problems because they'll be dealt with because you have people who are serving the Lord. And they, they kept on saying, they said, uh, they said, we need more information. They kept on saying that. It was, it was kind of one of these things, that all these centers. We need to inform the people more. We need to, we need to give them more information. And I, I, in, in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, the people are informed. I mean, they know what they ought to be doing. They're not doing it. There's a difference, a big difference between information and motivation. I was ready to scream that at them too, but I didn't. I just was like, I'm just going to calm down. I'm not going to say anything. And, and, uh, but here's the reality. You can inform someone to death. If you don't motivate them, you'll never get to the destination. 
Uh, you know, if you do what you always do, you'll get what you always got, right? So I'm thinking to myself, we, we, need, we need to be responsible. And as Christians, we need to be responsible. We can be informed. We have the entire Word of God at our fingertips, at our disposal. And He actually tells us what our rewards will be for our faithfulness. And we just kind of... We pass on those pages and we say, why? why? When we can be responsible people, we'll get a tremendous reward. We need to be responsible. Can I say this in conclusion? That acceptance can be a really good thing if you're aiming at the right thing. Acceptance can be a really good thing. And the Bible says, the Bible says that Ephesians 1 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. What does that mean? That we are accepted in the beloved? Can I share with you an illustration? I want to show you this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. And I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. God loves us, hates our sin. There are a lot of people who say, well, if I just, um, if I just uh, work really hard, they say that maybe if I'll turn over a new leaf, maybe, maybe I'll be accepted in the beloved. Maybe I'll go to heaven if I do that. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the wages of sin, that's the payment for the sin, is death. Well, you owe a sin debt, which is death. And the payment for that is death. It's not church membership. It's not walking an aisle or raising a hand or praying a prayer. We talk about this every Sunday. It's not about being good. It's not about works. Not about your works. The Bible says it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. I want to show you this. This hand representing you and me and this wallet representing sin. I want this hand right here to represent the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came to die on the cross for our sin. Did you see that? He came to this earth to die on the cross. We talk about Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. The wages of sin has to be a death. And 2,000 years ago, he did that for us. You see, it wasn't about us turning over a new leaf or getting baptized or walking an aisle. It's when we trust Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works. You see, salvation is apart from your works. But your reward in heaven when you get there will have everything to do with it. You don't go to heaven because you're good. You go to heaven because Jesus was perfect and he died on the cross for your sin. A lot of churches, they confuse the two the two. Uh, Ideas they can they confuse salvation and service. They confuse what it takes in order to to go to heaven and then the rewards that you get when you're in heaven. And can I say this that there is a a huge difference. If a person is here on this earth trying to work their way to heaven, they won't get there because they're trusting in themselves. And the Bible says, "For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves." Salvation is simply when you believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin, He was buried and He rose three days later. And friends, if you've done that today, you are saved going to heaven when you die. But as Pastor Dave preached last week, now we need to be redeeming the time. What are you doing with your time? What time is it? It's time to get serious. It's time to embrace these responsibilities that we have as a Christian. Not to work for our salvation, not to work towards our salvation, to work because of our salvation. The Lord loved us and died for us. The least thing we can do is live for Him. Friends, if you haven't done that today, I'm just asking you that you place your faith in Christ alone as your Savior. And that you'd understand that He died on the cross for your sin. And He gives you eternal life because of that. Simply by faith alone in Christ alone.